My talk will be, uh, okay, uh, first of all, uh, I'm really g very happy to be here and uh, to, to see uh, all my friends from, from Russia and from Germany, also the big German delegation. Uh, so my talk uh, will be uh, mm, essentially about geometry and uh, I will show many pictures. So, but there is uh, uh, a story about uh, discrete integrable systems, uh, which uh, is uh, in the basement of, of this theory and I will touch this uh, uh, theory and will uh, show you a couple of equations uh, that describe this uh, geometry analytically. So uh, the whole story is about minimal surfaces and this is the only smooth slide I have here. Yeah? So th this is about smooth theory and uh, minimal surfaces uh, can be uh, described and in, in defined in many, many uh, different ways and uh, there are surveys about minimal surfaces uh, and these surveys start with uh, about 20 uh, uh, various definitions. Uh, so let me mention just a couple of important properties uh, of minimal surfaces. They will appear uh, when we will start to discretize them. So uh, the, the most obvious definition is that they minimize uh, the area. <coughs> So the uh, second definition, which is uh, equivalent, of course, is that uh, uh, on such a surface, uh, the mean curvature vanishes. The mean curvature is just the sum or half sum of uh, two principal curvatures. On the surface, you have two principal directions, uh, and the half sum of these uh, uh, curvatures is called the mean curvature. So the Gaussian curvature, I remind, is uh, the product of these two principal uh, curvatures. So if uh, the minimal, uh, if the if the mean curvature vanishes, this is the uh, this is a minimal uh, this is a minimal surface. So analytically, if you look at conformal metric on this surface, then it uh, satisfies the Liouville equation. So that's the conformal factor, and z is a conformal coordinate uh, on the surface. <coughs> So also, uh, there exists an explicit representation for minimal surfaces in terms of holomorphic data and therefore all this theory has, uh, of course, a lot to do with uh, complex analysis and can be sometimes uh, seen as a branch of complex analysis with very strong uh, geometric component, of course. So, and uh, another important property is that mm, uh, um, uh, minimal surfaces minimize the Dirichlet energy. Uh, well, actually, this is not this U, but uh, another map. Uh, uh, so, and th these are just several properties of minimal surfaces. So, in this picture, you can, can imagine you have a cube. You fix these uh, circles on the faces of the cube, and then construct a surface that minimizes the area with these fixed boundary conditions. And this is the answer. This is so-called uh, uh, surface, uh, Schwarz surface. Sorry. So uh, my talk will be about the discretization, and that's what uh, we we are doing in Berlin, and that's what uh, is uh, uh, now developing between mathematics and uh, computer science. Uh, so here you see two images. One, uh, both actually are from computer science. So, and the left image is uh, an image of a triangulated surface, which should be uh, considered as an analog of a uh, uh, smooth, uh, non-parameterized surface. And uh, the right image is, uh, you see, it has lines on it, and uh, this uh, surface is built out of uh, quadrilaterals. So this is a discrete analog of uh, parameterized surfaces in differential geometry. So windows of your car are holes, because they're not quadrilaterals. Well, you can uh, not analytically, but extend this, uh, this car and uh, parameterize the rest, yeah. So this is just the piece which is made out of metal, yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to uh, present some discrete uh, curvature theory, so we will consider only uh, quadrilateral surfaces, surfaces uh, that can be seen as parameterized, 
uh, discrete uh, surfaces. And uh, of course, there are many ways to define curvatures uh, and to develop this discrete theory. So we will uh, start with the following uh, fact from the smooth theory. This is so-called Steiner formula. So, uh, so what you see here is uh, a surface. And this is uh, the normal shift of your surface. So you shift every point on the surface in the normal direction by the same distance and get a parallel surface. So and then you compare the areas of your original surface with the area of this surface. So and of course uh, you do this infinitesimally or you write this integral. So and if you consider uh, how this area changes infinitesimally then you see that the area element of your original surface F and the area element of your obtained uh, so parallel surface Ft are related by the so-called Steiner's formula. There is a pro coefficient between these infinitesimal areas and this coefficient turns out to be quadratic with respect to this shift parameter, to this distance parameter. So this is not obvious, this, uh, uh, but this is a, th a theorem. And the coefficients in this uh, Steiner formula are, of course, geometric, and these coefficients are the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature. So uh, the idea is uh, just to try to uh, uh, discretize this Steiner formula and look uh, uh, what kind of uh, notions for discrete curvatures we will obtain this way. It's exact. It's exact. It's exact, yeah. So th this is non-trivial. That's, uh, that's a theorem, yeah. So you will see that in the discrete case it will be much simpler. Yeah. So okay, now let us try to uh, look at quadrilateral surfaces. And uh, if you have a quadrilateral surface, then uh, there is a difference with the smooth theory because there is no canonical normal. Yeah? So you don't know what is the direction of the normal uh, at this vertex. There are many options, of course, for this. So for a smooth surface, you have just one option. Therefore, uh, let us take a surface with uh, with normals. Normals are given to us, for us. And they should satisfy uh, one condition. And this condition uh, is the following. It is so-called line congruence condition. The lines or the normals uh, at neighboring vertices of our surface intersect or are coplanar. So this is the condition that if you go along uh, on your surface along such a parameter line, then your normal goes straight and, don't, uh, and doesn't bend to the right and, or, or to the left. Yeah? So this is a condition for, or which characterizes the curvature lines on the surface. Okay, now you see we are going in the direction of this Steiner formula and let us consider a parallel surface. So uh, it's uh, more or less obvious that, uh, well, you simply shift this, this plane and get this piece and you can play this game for this whole surface. There is a parallel surface obtained in this way and it is determined by just the choice of one point uh, of it. Um, this quadrilaterals are not supposed to be flat. The, uh, the quadrilaterals here are flat, yeah, flat. are flat, for, yeah. For yeah, yeah uh, thank you for, for your question, yeah, so I forgot to say that. They're, they're flat. The, the normals you define, how, how much is the restriction? Is there lots of freedom? Well, uh, you see everything, yeah? So that's what you have. You have your quadrilateral surface, the quadrilaterals are flat, and you have uh, these normals, the normals are coplanar, yeah? So you can... Uh, uh, count the number of parameters, or you can uh, think how to generate the, the such pictures, but uh, f f let us assume that we have uh, such a picture already. Okay, now we just take one quadrilateral and uh, develop the theory just for this one quadrilateral. So that's uh, our surface. This is our parallel surface, and the difference is the Gauss map. So we just bring all this uh, normal vectors to the same uh, base uh, point. Okay, and now uh, we are uh, trying to uh, mimic this uh, Steiner formula, and in the discrete case, it's uh, quite natural. Um, the area element is now a quadratic form on the space of polygons with parallel edges. The first observation is that all these three polygons 
three quadrilaterals we see here, they have parallel edges. That was built in in our uh, construction. This edge is parallel to this edge and this parallel to this edge. This is just the difference of these two. So, and then uh, we just compare the areas of these uh, three quadrilaterals. Uh, it's a quadratic form. Uh, maybe I will first show you this slide. So let us look at this uh, space, at the space of quadrilaterals with parallel edges. So this is a two-dimensional vector space. So, and of course we allow uh, self-intersections. So, uh, uh, so here we see elements in this space. And uh, our uh, area is a, a quadratic form on this space, on this two-dimensional uh, vector space. So every quadratic form has its uh, uh, corresponding bilinear symmetric form. And so therefore I have written down this in this way with two arguments. And then uh, we just use the fact that this is bilinear and obtain this quadratic expression with respect to t here. So this means that in the discrete case, this quadratic term is obvious. So this this, 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 this uh, quadratic polynomial is obvious. And we simply denote the corresponding coefficients by h and k. And look what kind of expressions do we get for uh, k and h from here. K is the quotient of the areas of this quadrilateral <coughs> and this quadrilateral. This is exactly the same fact which we have in this smooth theory. And for the mean curvature you obtain uh, well, uh, a formula which doesn't exist in the uh, smooth world. So you have this bilinear symmetric form, A, uh, applied to F and N. F is this uh, quadrilateral and N is this quadrilateral. And this is so-called mixed area. So mixed area is the uh, symmetric bilinear form. And, uh, well, that's... Uh, uh, that's the formula from the linear algebra course. So if you have a quadratic form, you can represent the bilinear symmetric form by this formula. And this is a sort of a scalar product on the space of these uh, quadrilaterals. Okay, so now we continue uh, to define our objects. Discrete minimal surface uh, is this line congruence net, the surface with uh, these line congruences, with vanishing mean curvature for all, uh, for all faces. Uh, the formula for the mean curvature was this one. It vanishes if and only if this uh, uh, mixed area vanishes. And now we will look what does it mean that the mixed area uh, for, uh, vanishes for all corresponding quads of F and N. And uh, in this way, we come to the notion of dual quadrilaterals. I recall you that now we are doing the, all this theory just for one quadrilateral, yeah? So there is no surface, yeah? uh, But still, there are some interesting facts about quadrilaterals. So first, definition. Two quadrilaterals, P and Q, with parallel edges, we are in this vector space, are called dual to each other if their mixed area vanishes. So this, our mixed area scalar product, uh, is equal to zero. And then it's uh, very easy to, under, to understand that for every plane a quadrilateral, a dual one exists and is unique up to scaling and translation. This follows, of course, from the fact that we are in two-dimensional vector space and this uh, mixed area is just a scalar product. You have uh, an orthogonal direction. So, uh, and uh, what is not obvious, but uh, geometrically very interesting, uh, is that this orthogonality property can be characterized also geometrically. Two quadrilaterals with parallel edges are dual if and only if their diagonals are anti-parallel. Let me explain you what does it mean, yeah? So that's our quadrilateral, and we are looking for dual quadrilateral to this one. So P1, P2, P3, P4, and that's the dual one. The edge, Q1, Q2, the indices correspond is parallel to this edge. The edge Q2, Q3 is parallel to this edge, and so on. But the diagonals, you see P1, P3, is parallel to the uh, other diagonal, Q2, Q4. And this diagonal, P2, P4, is parallel to the diagonal Q1, Q3. So, and if you uh, just uh, uh, ask for uh, require this property, then you end up exactly with this geometry, and the dual quadrilateral is unique up to scale. Anti-parallel sounds a bit <laughs> tricky. 
So I, I, I don't think that there is a canonical definition of what does it mean, anti-parallel. So therefore, yeah. I'm uh, allowed to use it. So this means that non-corresponding diagonals are parallel. Non-corresponding non diagonals are parallel. You're right, yeah. So OK, now, that was a story about just one quadrilateral. Now let us uh, pass to a surface. Uh, uh, we would like to have all quadrilaterals dualizable. And then there is some closeness condition that if you dualize this quadrilateral, then you dualize this, this, and this. Then you uh, uh, come back. And uh, a quad surface, uh, this is just a definition. We call such dualizable quad surfaces Koenig's nets. Uh, if it admits a dual net F star, that's the global one. So all the corresponding quadrilaterals uh, are dual. And there is a projective characterization. It turns out that this is a projective notion, notion in projective geometry. A discrete surface with planar faces and non-planar vertices, a piece of this surface you see here, is a discrete Koenig's nets if and only if the intersection points of diagonals of any four quadrilaterals sharing a vertex are coplanar. So you just consider the intersection points of these diagonals, these four, and they should be coplanar. That's the condition. If you have this property, then uh, the thing is dualizable. You have Koenig's nets and so on. So, and then. Uh, and the latest statement, it's a necessary and sufficient condition. Yeah, yeah, it's different only if, yeah. So, uh, uh, and then we uh, have solved the problem in a way, yeah? So, if F is a discrete Koenig, uh, Koenig's net, then you just dualize it, treat this uh, dual surface as N. Uh, and take this pair, and this will be a minimal surface because these two guys are orthogonal with respect to our mixed area scalar product. Uh, here you see an example. That's an example of uh, a net. A and this is uh, an involution, therefore you can start with N, dualize it, and obtain F. So that's uh, the story. Uh, that's a Koenig's net. You dualize it and obtain this net. So this can be seen as a minimal surface, and this is as its Gauss map. And then immediately you see that there is a problem. Yeah? Because, uh, okay, this looks like a minimal surface, this looks like a Gauss map, maybe a little bit deformed. But on the other hand, uh, the whole theory is absolutely symmetric. I, I, I could say, uh, okay, this is my minimal surface and this is its Gauss map, which is absolutely wrong. Yeah? So uh, uh, then we are far away from smooth theory and we are going to discretize our smooth theory. So what's the problem? Uh, we uh, went too far with our generalizations, of course. Yeah? So uh, we should be more uh, uh, specific and we should somehow uh, build it to the theory the fact that N is the Gauss map and the Gauss map uh, has to do with spheres. <coughs> so that's our minimal surface. We don't know much about it, but this is the Gauss map. It should be a sort of a discrete sphere. So the next problem will be, okay, what are discrete spheres satisfying all these uh, properties to be Koenig's net or discrete uh, spheres. Three natural types of spherical polyhedra. Well, this, uh, the first case, the vertices lie on the sphere. The second case, planes are tangent to sphere. And there is also an interesting third case where the edges <coughs> are tangent to sphere. So three cases. And uh, it turns out that all three cases are interesting. All three cases uh, lead to integrable systems and uh, to minimal surfaces. And uh, this theory is nowadays already rather well developed. So uh, there is an old paper about circular uh, minimal surfaces. Uh, there is a paper about Kirby type, about this type. And there is a new paper about uh, conical uh, minimal surfaces. I'm going to talk essentially about uh, these uh, discrete minimal surfaces or, or of this uh, type. And this is work in progress. Therefore, some pictures are not yet uh, quite perfect. Edges, uh, faces, faces touch, uh, touch a sphere. Why it is called conical? So imagine you are at this vertex, yeah? So you have faces, they touch a sphere, so you have a piece of your surface and you can put a sphere uh, there in such a way that it touches all the faces. So you can replace now this sphere by a cone and this cone will be inscribed in this piece of your surface, yeah? And that's why that's uh, the explanation of this term. Okay, uh, and also there are three types of uh, so-called offsets. 
Um, I'm back uh, to our discrete surfaces and to the parallel uh, surfaces. So you have three cases. In the first case, when you have circular uh, surfaces, uh, your Gauss map has vertices on the sphere, lying on the sphere. This means that all these vectors have the same length. So this means that the distances between these two surfaces, uh, we see only one quadrilateral, but you have the, the, the picture for the whole surface, uh, are e all equal if you measure the distances between the vertices. So in the second case, you have this plane touching the sphere. And this means that the distance to the, this plane is constant. This means that the distance between these two planes is constant. So you have two surfaces, a discrete surface and it's parallel, and the distance between the planes of these surfaces is constant. And the third type, this Kirby type, it means constant distance between the edges. Then you measure here the distances between the edges. So three theories, all three make geometric sense and all three are very interesting. Okay, uh, for example, why it is called circular, uh, this, this first uh, type. Uh, the vertices lie on the sphere, but then, of course, uh, if they lie on the sphere, and they are also coplanar, then of course they lie on the circle. But then you know that these edges are parallel to these edges, and this means that uh, both these surfaces, uh, both these quadrilaterals are also circular. So this means that you're uh, dealing with surfaces that have uh, inscribed uh, quadrilaterals. So, but that's uh, not our main point today. So I will uh, go to conical surfaces. And uh, here uh, uh, you have a chance uh, to develop a global theory of these surfaces. And uh, the reason for this is that there exists uh, a theory of so-called Kerber polyhedra and of circle patterns and so on, which can be used here uh, to construct and to investigate these surfaces. Let me uh, just say a few words about uh, the corresponding uh, uh, theories. Um, consider this third case. When we have polyhedra, uh, that have edges that are tangent to a sphere. So here you see the sphere. Uh, and the polyhedron is shown in, in green. The vertices of this polyhedron are here. They lie outside the sphere. And this is an edge of a polyhedron. This edge touches your sphere at this point. And uh, all edges of this polyhedron uh, touch a sphere. So you can... Uh, see this picture in the following way, you have not the sphere but uh, the ball and then you cut uh, the pieces of this ball by uh, the planes of your quadrilateral, uh, uh, of, your, of your polygon, of your polyhedron, sorry, uh, and th then uh, you create this uh, gray disk, but uh, in, in this picture uh, they're, they're not like really plain, these are the pieces of the sphere. Yeah. So that's a typical Kerber polyhedron, which we see here. So, and there is a big theory about this. Uh, and the main theorem in this theory uh, claims the following, that every polytopal cell decomposition of the sphere can be realized by a polyhedron with edges tangent to the sphere. This realization is unique up to projective transformations which fix the sphere. What does it mean? You give me a combinatorial sphere and uh, well, something which can be realized combinatorially as a sphere. And uh, there is essentially unique realization of this sphere in the form of a polyhedron that satisfies the property that all edges of this polyhedron are tangent to the sphere. Yeah? So combinatorics determines the geometry in this case. So it's uh, not exactly unique. It's uh, 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 unique, essentially, up to Möbius transformations, but we will uh, come to this. Okay, so that's uh, what is called uh, uh, Kerber polyhedron, and now we will. So, you have a polytopal decomposition of a sphere. Right. 
what are information? Or you preserve just combinatorics? Combinatorics. You, you just take the combinatorial data. Just, just combinatorics? Just combinatorics, yeah. And there is essentially unique realization. Yeah. So, uh, uh, okay. Uh, let us look at this picture again. Uh, you see some circles on your sphere already, but you see not all of them. So if you consider these uh, points, which I show now in red, these touching points of these circles, then there is one more circle here li lying on the sphere. So and uh, its uh, mm, circle can be uh, described uh, in the following way. You take this tip of uh, the, the, this uh, cone of your uh, polyhedron and consider the cone that touches your sphere. And uh, the touching circle will be exactly the circle that intersects all these four circles of the organ. So in this means that if you do this for all vertices of your polyhedron, you end up with such a circle pattern on a sphere. And this is a orthogonal circle pattern. And this is, uh, now here we don't remember which circles we have started with first and which uh, we have added. So they come symmetrically. And uh, you also can uh, uh, extend this Kerber polyhedron we have started with a little bit, yeah? So now you take all these circles, and for all these circles, take the cones that uh, touch the sphere along these circles, yeah? So take these points, yeah? yeah. So then uh, this there is a vertex here, there is a vertex here, and there is an edge of your polyhedron connecting these vertices, and there is an edge of this polyhedron connecting these vertices, so you end up with a picture like this. So automatically it will be already a quadrilateral decomposition. Uh, all the faces will be planar. Uh, you, and uh, you obtain a circumscribed polyhedron with quadrilateral faces. So we, we have started with the Kerber polyhedron, the edges were tangent to the sphere. Now we ha have taken this Kerber polyhedron with its dual and obtained a uh, circumscribed polyhedron with quadrilateral uh, surfaces, uh, quadrilateral faces. Now the faces are uh, touching. We have quads with orthogonal diagonals and uh, these uh, quads touch your sphere at the intersection points of the diagonals. So maybe uh, it's a rather complicated picture, and maybe I will show you uh, one more uh, attempt to visualize it. Uh, that's an orthogonal circle pattern on the sphere. Now you take this circle, and that's the tip of the cone that touches the sphere along this circle. So here you'd have another circle. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's another circle. That's the tip of the corresponding cone. You connect these two edges, uh, these two vertices by an edge. This edge touches your sphere at this point. You have exactly the same picture for these two circles, and therefore this edge is orthogonal to this edge. They built a plane, a quadrilateral, with orthogonal diagonals, and this, uh, with this intersection point, and at this intersection point, your, ortho the, your quadrilateral touches uh, the sphere. How wide is the edge? Touch, touches the sphere. Why this edge? So this lies outside the sphere, yeah. and uh, these two circles touch at this point. Yeah. So you have a picture like this. Yeah. So you have this circle. Now you have this circle, and that's yeah. an edge that touches your sphere at this point. So okay. So you see that we end up with such. Uh, 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 polyhedron, which is circumscribed, which is built out of quadrilaterals. <coughs> and uh, an important fact about this uh, quadrilateral is that it is of Kirby type. It's also very uh, easy to see because uh, this planarity condition is satisfied. So the, these four points, they lie on the circle and therefore they are coplanar and you remember we had this uh, characterization. So, and then we start with uh, construction method. You start with a continuous surface, read, uh, uh, take its uh, Gauss map, 
consider the corresponding combinatorial data, construct Kirby polyhedron, and construct the corresponding uh, minimal surface. So uh, that uh, how it works, how how this works, and you end up with an explicit formula. Uh, uh, which is a discrete uh, Weierstrass formula. There exists an analogous formula in the smooth case. Uh, maybe it's uh, not very important. Uh, uh, what is important is that everything uh, is, of course, now based on these orthogonal circle patterns. You, you remember, if you have an orthogonal circle pattern on the sphere, then you uh, have this uh, uh, polyhedron. And analytically, orthogonal circle patterns are described by uh, Hirota equation. If you consider five, uh, uh, five uh, circles with the radii r and r1, r2, r3, r4, then they satisfy uh, this equation, which is a discrete Hirota equation. OK, so we would like to solve it and uh, to construct these uh, polyhedrons. So how to solve this equation? Actually, you have such an equation for every circle on, the, on your sphere. Uh, and the, since the picture is conformal, you can uh, solve your problem first in the plane and then lift it to the sphere by stereographic projection. So there are orthogonality conditions and the circles will be preserved. Uh, okay, so that's uh, now we uh, end up with uh, the theory in, uh, in the plane. And it turns out that uh, there is uh, an analytic mechanism to solve these equations, and this is a variational principle. So this equation I have written uh, down can be solved uh, uh, variationally. Um, and there is a functional. So instead of the radii, you write down uh, logarithmic radii, use them as uh, coordinates, write down some uh, functional in terms of dialogarithm, and then it turns out that the critical points of this uh, functional are exactly uh, solutions uh, to the system. And what is uh, very important here is that this functional is convex. So this means that uh, you can use it in, in your theory when you are proving uniqueness, existence, and so on, and also you can use it for computations. You just minimize this functional and obtain this uh, uh, polyhedra. So, and also, uh, that's, uh, this model has been uh, quantized already by Bajanov, Mangazeev, Sergeyev, and uh, it is called Fadeev Volkov solution of the Young Baxter equation. So, that's exactly this uh, model. Is it a wrong function for some? Yeah, yeah, it is. For, for, for triangle? Yeah, that's wrong in front of the triangle. Uh, OK, now the uh, construction method. Uh, I will show you a couple of examples just to demonstrate how, how this works. Uh, that's an orthogonal circle pattern, which is constructed uh, variationally. That's the corresponding Kirby polyhedron with its dual. And that's this uh, dualization uh, due to Koenig's nets. So and that's a discrete analog of uh, uh, conical minimal surface, which is uh, Schwarz P surface. So that's a picture uh, where we compare some classical uh, drawings from book by Schwarz. That's a continuous minimal surface, and that's our discrete uh, minimal surface, which is obtained this way. You see they uh, look very similar. And there is a theorem about the convergence. So that's a similar surface with the quadrilateral boundary conditions, smooth and discrete. So how boundary conditions are encoded in your circle? So that's another story. Yeah? So they can be encoded. Uh, with this functional, you can uh, really implement uh, uh, many possible boundary conditions. But it's a separate uh, story. So it's, it's, it can be done. Can you remind us, and Schwartz calculated uh, the minimal surfaces analytically or numerically, or what did he do? Uh, okay, for some, so, well, uh, all the surfaces I will show you, they have uh, analytic representations in terms of uh, Weierstrass formula. So there are analytic uh, data. So I don't know exactly how has he. 
Yeah, he, he knew the, the, this representation. I don't know how he has made this picture. Yeah? <coughs> so. so, some examples. Uh, discrete uh, shark minimal surface. And also, uh, uh, it's associated minimal surface. Everything is discrete, uh, conical. That's this, uh, these new results about uh, discrete minimal uh, conical surfaces. And I haven't explained you what uh, does it mean associate uh, minimal surface. Uh, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, no time, yeah? Two minutes, okay, thank you. So uh, in the smooth case, you have uh, one parameter deformation fi uh, family of minimal surfaces, which is an isometry and that preserves the Gauss map. So everything can be done in this uh, discrete uh, world, but I, I don't have time to, dis uh, to explain you all the details. So uh, let me show you a couple of images of uh, discrete minimal surfaces of uh, another type, of this uh, Kirby type. And uh, also, so maybe I will spend four minutes. Okay. Four minutes, yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah. So maybe I will spend my last four minutes uh, on some uh, unexpected uh, applications of all this. Yeah. So this is not virtual reality. This is reality. Yeah. So this uh, uh, these are real people who are really building this uh, uh, piece of the building. So this is so-called uh, free Where form. Is it? <laughs> Where is it? Uh, I don't think this is Sochi. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, what is I, I don't uh, I don't remember exactly of this, but the copyright is uh, Wagner Biro Stahlbau. Yeah, so yeah. that's the company. Um, um, you see, uh, so that's uh, a discrete surface, and uh, it has, of course, some constraints. For example. Uh, it, it's built out of glass, and therefore these pieces should be planar. This is, of course, not a problem if you have a triangular face, but this is already a problem if you have a quadrilateral face. And so here you see that this is really a problem. This is also not a virtual reality. This is a real picture. So here you see uh, s uh, your surface built out of quadrilaterals. There are quadrilaterals here. But as soon as it gets curved, uh, it is split in triangles. Why? Because these quadrilaterals are not planar. So uh, that's uh, uh, an extra incidence uh, condition which is uh, rather difficult to satisfy. Uh, and uh, that's one problem, how to build a surface out of uh, planar quadrilaterals, but uh, this mathematics I have explained to you is uh, related uh, to another problem. It's a problem about uh, 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 offsets. So imagine you have such a surface uh, which is thick. Yeah? So you have glass, uh, surface built out of glass on that side and surface bl uh, built out of glass on that side. And this reminds me already this parallel surface construction uh, which we had. So and this is a building element of such a surface. Yeah? So imagine you have a piece of glass here, 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 and here, and they fit together. And from another side, you also have uh, pieces of glass. And then there are three different cases. So you have two such surfaces. Either the distances between these two points are constant all over the surface, or the distances between the glasses, are the, between the, places, uh, the planes are constant, or the distances along the, uh, 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 along the edges are constant. All three make sense, especially the second two, make sense uh, uh, architecturally. Yeah? Because, uh, well, that's what we, you, you have uh, uh, with these uh, windows, yeah? with double glazing of our houses, and then, of course, that's what you would like to have uh, uh, in the freeform architecture as well. And that's uh, uh, this uh, condition that uh, tells you that you, sh you are going to investigate conical surfaces. This is an example, and that's exactly our Schwarz surface I have presented you in another visualization. In this case, this surface holds all these edges of constant weight. Uh, and this is all already visualized architecturally. And this is not only a virtual reality, so there is a new development. Yeah, so you all know this building. And now uh, there is an interesting construction, which is uh, 
being built right now on this building on the first floor. Uh, so this is so-called uh, uh, pavilion, uh, and uh, the, these glass uh, pieces of glass which you have here, they built a conical surface. So if you are going to applications, then they of course uh, should get rid of this integrability. So, but some geometric properties uh, are uh, preserved. In this case, uh, that's the property of the surface to be uh, conical or maybe a, of uh, Kirby type. So, but of course, uh, one constructs these surfaces already uh, essentially variationally, and uh, 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 some parts of this theory uh, are used there. So, okay, thank you very much for your attention. I will just finish with this. Just uh, about integrability. Would you add a couple of words? About integrability. So, uh, okay, all these three theories I have explained circular, conical, and of Kirby type, they are all three integrable uh, systems. So, they uh, essentially, two of them. Hamiltonian treatment? No, no. So, Hamiltonian description here is not. Uh, important, it's Lagrangian description what we, we, we are using here. So we have this action functional and uh, that's, uh, uh, well, it is related to uh, to this plurilateral Lagrangian systems which we are uh, trying to develop now. Yeah? So you have a, a Lagrangian system which is Lagrangian with respect to all high times, so to say. Yeah? So, but uh, Hamiltonian picture uh, well, it's not uh, very important here because uh, the construction is variational, description is variational. But you have something like time evolution. Uh, uh, it's just it's time evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, but there are alternatives, right? Time. Well, uh, where uh, I have skipped this uh, part, but this associated family uh, thing is related to integrable system. This parameter, one uh, uh, parameter deformation family, mm -hmm. this parameter is the spectral parameter. Uh, and so we change the spectral parameter and we deform our minimal surface. So that's uh, where this, uh, 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 this uh, theory of integrable systems appears. Let's thank the speaker once again for the question.